What's up, Energy Fam? This is Justin, and welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. My goal with each episode is to deconstruct the minds of today's energy thought leaders to uncover their framework and tools used in their journeys of providing energy to the world. So sit back, relax, and remember that everything you see around you requires some form of energy. Perfect. Let's kick this off. You good? I'm good. Let's go. All right. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy. I'm here with Sarah Stogner, entrepreneur, small business owner, lawyer, energy expert, mom, and a lady who's running for the Texas Railroad Commission to end the corruption and failure that are damaging our economy and endangering our water. And she also claims to be a true conservative. Sarah, welcome back to the show. How you been? I'm great. I mean, the Astros won last night in Dallas. It was a lot of fun. That's uh, so. I have to ask: When you're like, it, w- what's the fan base like there? If you're wearing or rocking an Astros jersey, or the, you're clearly there to represent the Astros, do you get a bunch of like crap, or how does that work? You know what? I mean, we were on like lower, but beneath the field, you know, so right at field level in a club, so it was a nice area. Yeah. Um, but everyone was really nice, and I think there was just a general pride of Texas, you know, which was <laughs> yeah. nice. It was like, even if. If we lose, I'm okay losing to another Texas team, you yeah. know, I think. Um, Better than playing the Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. And so, I mean, again, we won coming off of a, a, a shitty two two losses. Um, we're back playing tonight, right? Yeah, they yeah. play again in, in Arlington tonight. Beautiful. So have you always been an Astros fan, or did you jump on the wagon? Or No, you know, I think when I moved first moved to Texas in 2017, and I actually – thought it was funny you know with the cheating and I and I I started researching because it that's what grabbed my attention because I grew up in Southern California I was a Angels fan as a kid ah. and uh, my parents were Braves fans because they were originally from Alabama so I grew up as a kid going to Dodgers games uh, you know Angels games in California and um, and so as an adult I hadn't really been paying attention much and then I started and I was like they're all cheating is what's cheating you know and then I, I started getting into it and then I followed them and then I figured you know I think even without someone with a zoom lens in center field they were doing okay yeah no kidding well they, they're doing well I mean there was like a month ago they didn't even know if they're gonna make the playoffs so it's been cool it's been fun everyone and their dog is wearing Astros gear right now uh speaking of that we're at the petroleum club this is your first time here is that true I think it is I mean I've been to like the Petroleum Club in New Orleans and Midland and yeah uh, for some reason I don't think I've ever been to the Houston Petroleum Club That's before which hilarious. is kind of crazy and it's such an honor that I get to be here with you <laughs> I feel like it's you know it's a memorable moment um what do you think so far is it's it beautiful good? right yeah yeah it's uh and you know I've had a lot of good experiences here there's a lot of good speakers who come through here um you know, one of which Richard Spears, uh, he plays. He's always in, good. Yeah, he's good. He comes through here once a year towards the end of the year to kind of give a recap. And um, there's just always good events. And I encourage anyone, if you're in the Houston area, to at least come check it out. Um, there's always events. And, you know, th- it's good to support it. Because a lot of times, like, it's been told us, like, the patrolling clubs are kind of for, like, the older executives. And it can be stuffy. But the reality is, like, anyone can come here and enjoy it. You know what I mean? So uh, I want to give a huge shout out to the patrolling club. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, what brings you to Houston to begin with? Why are you here? Yeah, so um, I'm the keynote speaker at the Sipes Lunch yeah. um, after we record this. Beautiful. And what are you talking about? I don't know yet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, I mean, uh, I'll probably talk about my zombie wells and yeah. what I'm doing and who I am because, right. you know, I think a lot of times people, uh, their first impression of me is something from my online presence mm-hmm. and things that you say online to get the algorithm interested in you isn't always uh, maybe the best first impression for people <laughs> and so I, I I just enjoy the opportunity to tell people look I'm not anti oil and gas I'm not stuffing box Karen right right I, I love this industry and I'm I just, just gonna call you Karen from now on <laughs> oil and gas Karen <laughs> right? th- I mean seriously that I, I posted that first leaky well on LinkedIn yeah in 2020 I think and um, I, the, within a few minutes, it was stuffing box Karen, and I Gosh, I just cracked so up. Funny. I thought that was so funny. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like you use the fuel as like to put to add to the fire, right? Oh. Like I think you use it as like you don't just like like turtle off and you're like, oh, everyone's hating on me. Like yeah. I feel like you, you have enough self confidence and you understand your subject matter enough to where you're like, 
I don't really don't care what you're going to say because here's where here's the path that I'm on and I'm going to get there come hell or high water regardless of what you say or how you say it, uh, which I respect for you because you, especially in oil and gas and then, you know, tr- running for a railroad commission, like you have to be pretty much ruthless, right? But it, but in a kind way, like you can't just say F everybody who doesn't like you need to like figure out the balance. Yeah, right? you got to be OK with people being unhappy with you. Good point. Yeah. And if people aren't unhappy with you, you're probably not doing anything worthwhile anyways because you're not making moves and well, making you know, changes. That's true. And I feel like everyone, someone who tries to please everyone, you're not really being true to yourself because everyone wants something different. And so if you feel like you can cater to everybody, well, eventually it's like then you're kind of like playing on both sides, yeah, right? Which is most politicians, right? Good point. They'll walk into one room and, you know, they'll walk into a room of oil and gas folks and say one thing. And then they'll walk into a room of ranchers and say another. And Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, how is the media presence nowadays? Are you still like full force ahead on TikTok and all the rest of it? Or how has that been going? Yeah. I mean, I create content. It's, I don't, I don't plan my content. So mm-hmm. my TikTok, uh, it has been a little bit dormant lately because I haven't been out in the field yeah. feeling inspired to I've been tweeting a lot or Xing whatever they're calling it now. <laughs> right? Good um point. uh but yeah, no, I mean I think the media is good. I just had an article uh, in Newsweek that came out I think yesterday or day before. Nice. Um I wrote an article for Nasdaq, so I'm getting wow. I'm getting published. Okay. Uh, I'm getting my voice out there and yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that I mean the Texas Tribune came and saw us at Tripfest, which hmm. uh is I highly recommend. I'd never been, but it it's the Texas Tribune in Austin, and they shut okay. down Congress for a day and in front of the Capitol. And there are a few days of really good speakers from across mm. the country. It's a bunch of political science and journalist nerds, really. Yeah. But it was great. I mean, uh, yeah. like the Odd Lots podcast that I like listening to, they, they were there live, and they were interviewing Jigger Shaw. And so I got to be oh. front row and see, like, nerdy podcast people that I like. Yeah. Uh, you know, just um, it was really cool. And so I'm getting to do a lot more stuff like that, I've I, since I left the Republican Party, I've said I'm not constant. I'm obviously not going to the traditional political events like I was last yeah, time, trying right. to uh, convince primary voters to vote for me. Mm-hmm. I'm really out there trying to inspire people who haven't been involved in the political process. That those are the people we really need to be involved in the political process. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt, but this episode is sponsored by 10X Technologies, pushing the boundaries of chemistry. 10X is innovating the future of the oil and gas industry with their proprietary materials-based technology solutions. With cutting edge products like NanoClear, custom designed nanofluids engineered to maximize the production of new completions and rejuvenate existing wells, 10X is driving a revolution in oil extraction. Meet Microhold, a specially engineered microparticle slurry that optimizes frac efficiency, props microfracs, and triggers far field diversion every well, every time sees the benefits. And if you're worried about frac hits, 10X has you covered with No Hit, an innovative technology that mitigates frac hits via in situ pressurization reaction. It's protection where you need it most. Then there's Sandbond, a sand consolidation chemical solution that's just another example of 10X's commitment to practical field ready solutions. And let's not forget about Seroflow, a greener, cost-effective, proprietary blend of design materials to banish paraffin issues once and for all. That's 10X, where innovation meets application in the oil and gas industry. Find out more about their groundbreaking solutions at pumpmoreoil.com. And be on the lookout for five, yeah, you heard it, five new products launching soon. Now, let's get back to the show. I mean, have you gained, like you said, since leaving the Republican Party, like what kind of strides have you been able to make? Have you had people get more involved or have people been more supportive or? Uh, you know, it's a it's a funny mixed bag. So I think um, some people have been a lot more supportive because they don't identify as a Republican. But a lot of my Republican allies have to quietly kind of support me now they can't Mm, right it's very much a partisan thing and if you're not going to stand united it's like a bad marriage you know where they want to beat you up in the house and then go outside and pretend like everything's fine and I think right now we're seeing in DC with McCarthy getting ousted and the inability of our elected leaders to pick someone that can lead the house is truly indicative of the downward spiral that I, I think uh, we're in right now yeah no it so how would you well for, I'm, I'm curious so on a, on a more macro scale we've got the presidential election coming up next year a lot could happen between now and then but like are you pleased with who's running oh god no i mean no i, I dislike trump and biden 
you know, okay. for different reasons, but I dislike them both, and I, I don't think either of them will be good for the country. Yeah. Um, Any R- other candidates? So RFK Jr. is, I think, who I'm most excited about, not because I agree with him on everything, but because I think he's our best chance at someone other than Trump or Biden. Gotcha. And so, you know, Cornell West has some interesting ideas. There's some others. There's some libertarian guys that I like, but a libertarian's never going to get elected because that's been yeah. an impotent party for 50 years, right? Yeah. So I think... Um, what I've learned is it's really parties at this point are, are obsolete in my view. Okay. You know, in the 1700s, 1800s, we needed parties because we didn't have access to information to be able to tell us what the people that were running believed, what their views were. Yeah. So you could affiliate with a party and then know when you went to the ballot, okay, these are my priorities. I'm going to vote this way to have yeah. those people promise to represent my values. Interesting. And That's a good point. instead, we've now bastardized that to it's simply a state fund we've got this state funded duopoly that has created a multi-billion dollar uh, industrial complex of consultants and fundraising and printers and flyers and ads and media Mm -hmm. and they all make billions of dollars meanwhile uh, we don't have functioning house of representatives because they no longer get into committees and have bipartisan negotiation right everything's become if you're a Republican, and you see it in Texas, right? If you're a Republican and you're putting Democrats on uh, committees and they're committing, they're, they're chairing committees and they're agreeing to things, it's like, yes, that's how you govern. You right. Both sides are supposed to come to the table, advocate for your position, and then come up with a compromise, right? right? Like that's fundamentally what governing is. And we've lost sight of that through this branding mm. that I think really started with Trump I mean, it didn't start with Trump, right? I think a lot of it was Newt Gingrich, if you go like back 30 years, okay. getting rid of committees and things like that. But uh, where we are now, I think, is this spiral of social media that really Trump took advantage of in 2016. Yeah. And that kind of continued exponential, uh, just like raising it one more. And the fact that we're now, you know, focused on critical race theory and environmental social governance is a bad word it's like wait do we not all care about the environment being socially responsible and having good governance like i think most people do right but it's but it's the extreme on either end that are the loudest that then represent that side which is exactly right yeah i mean like in texas you've got eight hundred thousand primary republican voters and we've had all Republican state leadership for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So you have 800,000 people in the state of Texas deciding who our state leadership will be out of 18 million registered voters, right? And so it's, um, and what I learned going through the Republican primary process is the incumbents and the folks that ended up getting elected, they're not doing grassroots campaigning, right? They're having private dinners with donors making $100,000 campaign donations like those are the people that they're talking to Hmm. and it's created this duopoly that only serves itself and it's billionaire financiers not actual citizens anymore Hmm. so quick pivot you have a tagline that is hashtag uh, stronger with Sarah right and so I'm curious like what does that mean to you and how would you describe that to someone who's never met you or is interested like who is Sarah yeah Uh, okay so I, I came up with that because our energy industry is vibrant, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, If Texas was a standalone country on any given day, we'd be the third or fourth largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world. We're also leading the nation in solar and wind. And that's because of our unique grid market and right in other places you have to wait. You can't just go invest in a solar farm or a wind farm. You've got to apply and then wait for coal to go offline and then get allocated into the transmission right and so um there's it it can take five or ten years to get permitting in other states and so our our um some of our great qualities right um are being weaponized by current politicians again the same thing right where the left saying shut down oil and gas and the right saying no windmills it's like no, guys, we have 1,100 new people moving to Texas every single day. Wow. We have to make sure we have enough water for them to drink mm-hmm. and enough electricity for them to live their lives. Right. And right. so if we continue on the course that we're on, I think we're going to have significant environmental and economic consequences because, um, unfortunately, you are going to have these these crazy partisan 
ideas that instead of making good policy for the next hundred years in the future of the state that we're going to leave our grandkids, we're making policy based on what's sexy at the time with politics in two, four, six-year election cycles. Yeah. And I think that um, the problems I'm seeing on the ranch where I live in West Texas with these old plugged wells, for example, is a, a perfect example of uh, the problems that we're having. And it's going to take real leadership to make have hard discussions with people and let's be intellectually honest about where we actually are and what how this looks going forward and what we're going to do to fix this yeah so i mean you kind of mentioned it before we got going but what are you i mean really focused on right now where are you putting a lot of conservative effort into either changing or i mean something that just is, is taking up your time yeah so um right now i'm really trying to educate people on the, the numbers that we just talked about, the fact that 800,000 primary voters decide who our officials are in the state of Texas, the fact that a couple billionaires spend tens of millions of dollars every year in the state of Texas to buy up ads. Uh, we've got the, the GOP imploding right now. The, the official Republican Party of Texas, their young Republican group didn't like where the party was going and they left the party. Hmm. And a new young Republican group, I put that in air quotes if people are listening, <laughs> right, uh, was voted in actually, I think it was on the eve of Yom Kippur, and it is led by professed Nazis. Like, these are people who literally say, I am anti-Semitic, uh, my views on the world are Hitler-esque, that, um, I mean, really, really awful, hateful, and I mean, I'm one to, you know, I'm not... What? Yeah, it's yeah. Wait, it's, sorry. Yeah. Can you, so who is this? Again? Okay. So it's this new young Republicans group, and for example, you know who Nick Nick Fuentes is. He's a twenty-something year old YouTuber um, who is a white supremacist, like a claimed white supremacist, which is kind of ironic with the last what? name Fuentes. But um, what? Yeah, and and so he met in Dallas at Pale Horse Strategies, which is. Uh, Jonathan Stickland is a former Texas representative who now owns a consulting firm called Pale Horse, which is the reference to Revelations. Um, that is fun, owns a pack called Defend Texas Liberty, I believe. Hmm. They had a six hour meeting a week ago, a week and a half ago, with Nick Fuentes, this. I think he lives in Florida, but openly anti-Semitic, misogynistic. Uh, I think Stickland's the one that famously said uh, a, a man can't rape his wife because it's his, like, godly given right to have sex with his wife. I mean, like, these are people that are really espousing hate and, uh, you know, I think it's, you can't, you can't ignore it. You can't say, oh, well, it's just a couple people. Um, no, like there, you know, hate today has absolutely no place in yeah. political leadership. Is he gaining any ground on, with this sort of approach? You know, there, there's, there has been tens of millions of dollars invested in this message, and so what? From who? From the Wilkes brothers and Tim Dunn. I mean, like what? these are the billionaires funding Texas politics, and they're in oil and gas, right? These are oil and gas guys that have weaponized Christian nationalism. And so as a Christian, um, you know, I, it's really troubling for me when there's a concentration on hate and weaponizing, you know, they're in our bedrooms, they're in, in our schools, they're, they're trying to this whole voucher thing, right? Like this is a big thing. They're, they're, there's published literature about a plan for white Christian nationalism to take over all facets of government. And if that sounds crazy, I really encourage people to listen. There's a podcast called Grapevine, okay. and it follows, it just came out, um, and it follows, it's only six episodes, and I'm on episode three, and it follows um, a Grapevine family with a local high school and a, a trans teenager and a very religious mother and kind of the indoctrination and the verbiage that they're using because when you say things like 
we all want school choice, right? Like, yeah, I'm a parent. School choice seems good, mm-hmm. right? But when you actually start getting into the details of their policy, what it's doing is it's defunding public schools and it's diverting money to private schools. And it, there's no protection. Like, we have all these tests and all these accreditations. We have all these regulations and places for schools. So if our schools are not doing what they should be. The solution isn't just to change the money like we actually need to get in there and do some hard work to figure out why our schools are failing and we need to pay teachers better and yeah. we need right we, maybe we need to rethink the way we teach our kids maybe we shouldn't have kids at five years old sitting at a desk all day yeah. right i mean so again these are complicated issues and just like the energy stuff where people who don't understand the operational realities of exploring for and producing natural gas and, yeah. and oil right are uh there there's fear mongering there's taking advantage of of and when you get people motivated, anger and fear are two great emotions to play on. Yeah. And social media has weaponized that. I mean, Donald Trump's 2016 social media manager is a guy named Brad Parscales who has moved to Midland, Texas. He just bought an $800,000 house in Midland. Really? Yeah. And Jeez. so you're talking about nationally the GOP is investing a lot of money in Texas. And my theory is because Trump's trying to get off of his criminal stuff, he injected tens of millions of dollars into, te- into Texas with the Ken Paxton trial. And what I've heard from insiders in Austin is that Paxton was going to be charged and they were going to actually impeach him. And Dan Patrick, who received $3 million, this all right, ties back to the Stickland's PAC gives Dan Patrick a $3 million loan a couple weeks or whatever it was before the trial and then Patrick starts calling senators as they're deliberating telling them if you don't acquit I'm gonna make sure that you've got a primary challenger and so now our entire so my to wrap up my mission is to educate people that their elected officials no longer care about actually governing and doing their job yeah. their sole focus is on fundraising and to prevent facing a primary challenger because 90 something percent of incumbents get reelected. Right. And so you, you've got fa- a faction, you've got this Nazi faction of the Republican party uh, that is controlling the purse strings and putting people into power. It's crony capitalism. It's not, it's, it's an appearance of giving people right, a fair shake sure. and it's not. So if you, hypothetically, if you were in a position of power to, to fix this, like what would be sort of the, the step changes you would make to come up with the solution and what does that look like? Yeah. Okay. So I just read a really good book and I think it was called the, the, the political industry or the, the industry of politics or something like that, but it's out of Harvard business and they did a whole economic analysis of, okay, if this was a, a regular duopoly and you were going back in time like to the railroads or right any time that you've had some of these similar problems if you look at politics just like any other business it's a duopoly how do you fix that well and I like their recommendation it's all about fixing the primary process so you open the primaries to where you don't have to pick on election on primary day am I going to vote for on the Democratic primary or the Republican primary you have all primary candidates on one ballot Okay. And then for each position, the top five people advance to the general election. And then when you get to the general election, you give people the chance to rank or prioritize or star. There's several different ways, and there's pros and cons to each of them. But it's basically giving people a way to vote and not have to pick between throwing their vote away or the lesser of two evils. Right. So, so introducing more competition. Yeah. But haven't people tried, but it never works? Yeah, I think they've tried to create new parties. And so, and, you know, I announced in September that I'm trying to get the forward party ballot access in Texas. What does that mean? So what that means is, in Texas, is kind of crazy, right? Every state sets their rules. So in Texas, uh, to get on the ballot as an independent on the statewide ballot, it's all about a percentage of the votes cast in the last general election. Mm-hmm. So it's, an, it's a percentage. And so if I wanted to run as an independent to get on the railroad for the railroad commission, I would need a hundred and about 115,000 signatures, wet ink signatures with a notary, and you have 75 days to collect them. Hmm. If I'm trying to get a new party on the ballot, you have the same 75 days and you only need about 83,000 signatures 
Um, but they can't have voted in the Republican or the Democratic primary. So our primaries start the first week of March, and then some people that are involved, right, will go vote in their primaries, and then the runoffs will be in the end of May. Starting March 13th, I believe it is, would be the 75 days for us to gather 81 or 83,000 signatures, whatever the exact number. And you're going to need a cushion because some of those are going to be thrown out, right? Yeah. And inevitably, regardless of if you're successful, then the Republicans, because they're the uniparty in Texas, will sue you and to claim that some of the vote, the, the signatures aren't valid, try to get you thrown off. But once you have like the Libertarians, right? Jaime Diaz ran for Railroad Commission in 2022 on the Libertarian ticket. He got at least 2% of the ballot, so the Libertarian Party of Texas gets another 10 years on the ballot. Mm. The problem is, I think, is that at this point, a party is essentially a brand, yeah. and the, they've been impotent for 50 years, just like the Greens take away. And so they've served as this spoiler effect, right? So you get the Libertarians spoil the Republicans, and the Green Party spoils the Democrats. And if you start talking about having alternatives, people get really angry because they feel like their I ideals are being attacked. And it's like, right. guys, you're, it, it's just so ironic to me. If you're a Republican, or I, I, I use the term conservative now, right? Where, what happened to fiscal responsibility? What happened to balancing your budget? What happened to private property rights and bodily autonomy? And, you know, I, I think we're really to the point now where the Republicans took over the Whig Party, right? Okay. We need somebody to come in and take over the Republican Party. And so I, I'm working with this group called Forward, and their motto is not left, not right, but forward. And they, they call themselves a party, but they're really just a pack, yeah. right? I mean, they're a group of people that are organized with money, um, and they're trying to raise money. And it is really hard to try to raise money if you're not running a traditional Republican or Democratic race, right? Yeah. And so it takes somebody like, I just saw in the news, I think it was yesterday, that Harlan Crow in Dallas maxed out his federal contribution to Cornell West, who's running as an independent. Hmm. Um, and he left the Green Party, right? He originally announced that he was going to run as a Green Party candidate. And then he, after, I think it was after, maybe before RFK, but anyways, Right, so now we've got two guys that are running as independents on the presidential ballot, mm. which means that in every single state, they'll have to get ballot access as an independent. Mm. So in Texas, RFK's folks are gonna have to mobilize and get 115,000 signatures to get them on the ballot. And so when I decided I was no longer a Republican and that it didn't matter if I was able to win or not, I need, just needed to start getting out there and uh, evangelizing, for lack of a better term, with what I've learned and the problems and how I think we can fix it. Um, and I, I think that I could have run as an independent, but then I wouldn't have the opportunity to bring other people along with me, right? Yeah. Because you sign as an independent to get your name only. Mm -hmm. And if we're successful in getting the forward party on the ballot in November of 2024, then I'm hopeful that I can encourage or inspire more people like us who haven't thought about getting involved in politics but once they learn something and like their gut starts to, you know, how it is, yeah. and you just feel compelled to do something. And I, through prayer and consultation with you know, friends and family, I just really feel like I'm on the right track and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, so would you, with that all being said, does that mean eventually if all the stars align and, and the support's there and the finances are there, you would run, you could eventually run for president? <laughs> I have absolutely no aspirations <laughs> of any, really, I, 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 you're not supposed to say that you don't want the, the, the role that you're running for. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not excited to live in Austin and right be one of three commissioners like that does yeah. not sound fun but I think it needs to be done sure and so never say never but no I mean I, I hope that I could get in make some progress in that office because it's only one of three people right I'm not really going to change things other than bring transparency educate people advocate for a name change because people that aren't in the energy industry have no idea what the railroad commission does Right. I mean, right. those are little things and that's <coughs> intentional. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have people in power. Texoga lobbies really hard against a name change because they appreciate that average voters aren't getting involved. Right. 
So speaking about the Railroad Commission, you've been pretty outspoken about the Railroad Commission and how it's corrupt and likely failing Texas. Uh, could you elaborate on that uh, for those who haven't maybe been following along? Yeah. So well, first, the Railroad Commission regulates oil and gas, intrastate pipelines, and surface mining for things like coal and lignite. And um, right now, you know, my argument is that we don't need more regulation. We just need fair and consistent application of the rules that are already on the books. Mm -hmm. And that, in my view, the reason it's such a problem is because because oil and gas is a commodity, you can't compete if you're doing it the right way and other people aren't without consequences, right? So, and what we see in the Permian is we've got super majors, and it, I'm devastated that Exxon bought Pioneer. Why is that? Because Pioneer is one of the better operators. Like, they don't wait for somebody to tell them their stuff's messed up. They go and fix it. Just like Diamondback is has a really great concerted effort right now to get flares on every tank battery, to close the thief hatches, to stop fugitive emissions. You know, like. But uh, would you argue, like, would you argue that Exxon or someone like them is not doing that? They are not. Just okay. like Chevron's not, just like Shell's not, right? Why what do they you think do that is? Are they just slow, or do you think they don't care? No, it's money. Follow the money. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they come in, they uh, get all the easy money, and then what they're doing now is they're not selling their leases. They're literally giving them away. So you've got a lot of guys that are on their own. You know, for 750 bucks, you can get a P5 operator's license we we still have the old wildcat days of right if you wanted to go do it you could do it mm -hmm. and i love that spirit i don't want to destroy that spirit but at the same time guess what guys a well bore five thousand feet below ground lots of things can go wrong and when they do it's very expensive yeah and when you're coming in on a stripper well economics there's a lot of these wells that will from where we are now they have no money set aside for their decommissioning and they will never produce enough oil and gas to pay for that decommissioning they're upside right. down right right and so the super majors instead of doing the right thing have perpetuated that they're not pro timely plugging their wells they're letting them sit and rot for 35 years they're not and then when it fails enough mechanical integrity tests that they start thinking okay like the railroad commission's finally going to make us do something they don't fix it. They flip it to Joe Bob. Yeah. And then Joe Bob just is like, oh, you know, hey, I'm a pumper or, right? I mean, I'm in the industry and I know enough. And they get in and then six weeks later, they're calling me <laughs> going, hey, the Railroad Commission sent me a notice of violation. I've got a, an injection well that's shut in that now has 600 PSI of CO2 on it because the oxy flood next to me is migrating onto my lease. And guess what they don't have? Chrome tubulars, right? They haven't. So guess what we're doing? We're creating carbonic acid and we're eating through all the steel and, and cement. And so what I'm aggravated at is the folks in the industry that for years have been saying climate change is a hoax and are now gladly taking billions of dollars in federal money that we've printed and don't have to inject CO2, to direct air capture and inject CO2. Like, look at Chevron's project in Australia. It hasn't done what it said it was gonna do. Texas is, Oxy's building them in Crane County. I live in Crane County. Mm. If you've ever been to Crane County, it is a pincushion of wells. Yeah. And we've got 5,000 people that live in the county and no one gives a shit about our, our groundwater. No one gives a shit about our air. I mean, I wake up every morning and if the wind's still or southerly, uh, there's a tank battery, you know, a quarter mile away. And I wake up to H2S. Like, mm. And, and if one more person tells me that's the smell of money, I'm going to punch them in their face. Like, seriously? I'm like, no, that's not the smell of money. That's the smell of your dirty-ass water, water flooding, introducing bacteria that's farting. That's yeah. what that is. Like, let's actually talk about it. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, it again, and I've seen, as an oil and gas lawyer, I see the good guys trying to do it the right way. Yeah. And they get shit on. Hmm. And they're made fun of. They're ostracized. And then... They give up because you can't make money because if the guy next to you isn't doing what they're supposed to do to make sure that their surface casing is intact and protecting the groundwater yeah right i mean i literally had the railroad commission tell me that there was rule the rules say you cannot have sustained casing pressure on the brayton head 
that if you have that, it, you would need remedial measures to isolate and get rid of it. And we sampled gas, it was 97% nitrogen, and the Railroad Commission said, well, yeah, there's 100 PSI of pressure on the Braden head, and, but it's just nitrogen. Well, guess what comes with nitrogen? It's a gas, and it acts as a gas drive mm. for the fully saturated brine that's underneath it, right? And so it's like, look, guys, we're over-injecting produced water. We're injecting 19 million barrels of produced water a day. We formed this produced water consortium a couple of years ago that was supposed to help look at the technology and, and advise. Like, we do not have time to sit around and figure it out. Like, mm. someone needs, that's where we need to be investing billions of dollars, yeah. right? Like, let's put that to beneficial use. Let's get, uh, have an honest conversation about our water supply. We should not be using fresh water for anything right. other than direct human consumption and, mm. and ag at this point, right? Like, yeah. I mean, we don't have enough and no one and in, and instead we've now got i can't remember how many constitutional amendments coming up on the ballot um we're just um, printing more money again republican leaders that are supposed to be fiscally conservative yeah hmm. so when you look at the folks that you've mentioned that are not maybe doing it in a way they're pretending like they are but they're really not i mean how <clears throat> does someone like yourself go in and try and help those companies? I mean, or like, how does all that change? Yeah, I mean, if people want help, I, I, you know, but most people don't want help. They like yeah. the way it is. So what does it take? And unfortunately you get, there's so many good engineers and geologists and accountants and landman, right? Like I love this industry. I love the people in the industry. I love the spirit of the industry. Yeah. Um, and then you get good ones that start, you know, say, hey, saying something and they get promoted to Hawaii or Papua New Guinea or, right? Like mm -hmm. they intentionally don't keep people around with enough knowledge, they, they move them. And mm -hmm. that, and when, you, I, I had a geologist tell me her horror story. She was working for a super major. She uh, had some mechanical integrity issues in a field went to talk to her boss to say, hey, you know, our, our capital budget and our operating expense budget for the next 24 months doesn't take into account this problem. And they, they said, well, you need to figure out a way to not spend that money. And she's like, we, we can't, right? Like there's mechanical integrity issues. We need to go fix this. And they said no. And then she decided to take the stairs. It was, I guess, a couple of floors. And she decided to take the stairs back to her office feeling totally deflated. And they handed her a safety awareness ticket because she didn't have three points of contact on the stairs. Wow. Right? So we, our safety culture, right? I mean, people get so angry at me when I'm out on the, on the ranch that I live on not wearing steel toes and a hard hat. And I'm like, guys, this isn't a workover operation. This isn't operating well. If it's not safe for me to be standing by it, then it shouldn't be allowed to sit there. I'm not touching it. I'm not, right? Like, I'm not manipulating valves. Yeah. I'm standing by it. And, like, people are more concerned about safety goggles yeah. or not smashing a thumb than they are about widespread subsurface contamination that's happening and i mean we've got thousands of wow. it we've got thousands of square miles in the central basin platform that are cross-flowing subsurface aade meetings that i've been sitting in for 10 years and they were talking about four and five string casing designs now we're back to two and three did, why did we have to start getting more strings to begin with and then where did they go well, I mean, casing costs a lot of money. Exactly. And if no one's enforcing the regulations and no one gives a shit that you don't have a good cement job, why would you spend the extra money? Right. Huh. No, it's it's uh, it's a crazy topic. And so, I mean, have you, have you had, to, like, conversations with folks that, say, are on that side of the fence? And what's their argument to it? Or have you had a chance to really sit down and talk to anybody about it? Everyone that I talk to about it recognizes that it's a problem and wants to do something about it um, other than the lawyers. And what do the lawyers say? There's nothing wrong. We're complying with all rules. We're the human energy company. <laughs> okay. We're putting people first. Yeah. We're powering the world. 
<laughs> well, that's, huh. I mean, look me straight in the face. Yeah. And I'm like, well, here's a glass of water that I got out of my well today. Why don't you have a drink? Yeah. You can't. It's fully saturated brine, right? Like, I mean, the, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Right. We have pump jacks for a reason. Why is fully saturated brine flowing to surface? I've excavated 100 plugged wells. All of them are leaking. I have maybe three that look okay right now, but I've only excavated, you know, the first 10 feet. So if it continues down this path, what happens then? Um, I think the federal government starts shutting down things in a way that's not logical. Mm -hmm. And I think we have total economic collapse, probably right. World War III and the next Great Depression. Right. So the logically then, as an industry, we might as well get in front of it before the government steps in. Yeah, I mean, it, what, what, what I think is going to happen if we don't get our heads out of our asses is all of the super majors will be bankrupted by the uh, legacy liability of their old plugged wells. And the, what, what will emerge is a taxpayer funded cleanup and new companies because modern day society runs on oil and gas. Yeah, fascinating. That's such an interesting perspective. Um, I'm curious if anyone out there is listening would love to come on and debate. Sarah. I would love that. I'll debate anybody. Right. And because, I, I, you know, again, like what you're telling me makes a lot of sense. And it's like, holy smokes, this is clearly a problem. But there's probably a group of people or individuals that deep down think it's not a problem. And it's like it's it's interesting to consider someone's argument against what you're saying. Sure. And I invite I, you know I invite I mean? any yeah, I invite anyone in the industry to come visit my ranch and I will give you a personal zombie wells tour. Yeah. Wow. And and hopefully you will film the whole thing. Yeah, sure. I will. <laughs> or I'll keep it completely confidential if they don't want me to be mentioned. Sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, because li literally every... I've had probably 25 or 30 oil and gas professionals come out, and every single one of them goes, oh, my God. Like, I've seen your pictures. I've seen your videos. But, oh, my... Like, how? How is it this bad? And I'm like... Mm. Wow. That's crazy. So... Shifting gears here, let's talk, is there anything positive that you're seeing out there right now? Is there anything that's, that you can speak on that's... Yeah, I mean, I think we've got a younger, younger generation of people that really do want to do it the right way. And I think there's a lot of people our age who are willing to do the hard work mm -hmm. and want to be a part of the solution. Right. You know, I, I do. And I think... Um, I think we're going to continue to see that. And I think that, honestly, social media, as much as it can be negative, is a real positive because it's the great equalizer for access to information and good ideas, right? right? And it, if it hadn't been for social media, I would be still a nobody from nowhere. Sure. And now I can't really go anywhere without getting recognized. So yeah. even when I think that I'm incognito, <laughs> right? I went to the barbecue. It, uh, there was like a, there's an annual barbecue in Monahan's. And uh, I went last weekend and I didn't wear any of, right? I, I tried to really not look like Sarah's doctor, just like an ordinary. And I was recognized before I got to the front gate by a guy walking in. He's like, Stockner. And I was like, well, there he goes. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's good, right? Like, right. it means my messages work. It means I'm getting out there. It means yeah. people recognize me. Right. And, and I have a lot of people that message me all the time. That's like, thank you for what you're doing. You're making a difference. Yeah. Um, and, I, and there's been a huge shift. The comments aren't nearly as ugly. Really? And they're not stuffing box Karen. And, <laughs> but, you know, it's been a grind, box, right? Yeah. It's been three years of me daily talking about this stuff. No, you've been on a, like a relentless pursuit of, of, of doing this. And yeah, you've taken a few like licks to the chin, but here you are, you're still fighting. I'm scrappy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So if people do uh, want to get involved, it was, the movement was called the Forward? It's called Forward Party. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can go to my website, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, the number four, R-R-C, 
Facebook.com, uh, all my social media. I'm happy to introduce people because, like, this is the thing. We need about $1.5 million. Let's get down brass tacks. We need about okay. $1.5 million to hire the professionals and organize the volunteers to get this petition drive done. Gotcha. That's what it's going to cost. And right. I'm not motivated by money, right? Like, it's I hate asking people for money. Um, but, but at the end of the day, there's, there's a cost associated with doing what you're doing. Right. So it's like... But this is a very specific thing and if yeah. we're if we're not <coughs> successful and, I, and i've got let's see what's today mid mid-september i've probably october oh yeah oops mid-october <laughs> i probably like, well, i'm like i've got two months no oh, i've got a month and a half okay so if i don't if i can't get some serious momentum and get a few people really sold on this idea in the next six weeks yeah i'll probably just run as a libertarian like yeah. they want me Right, I could. I'll be on the ballot. I'll get them two percent at least. And the crazy part is, if I actually win, the Libertarian Party would have primary access in the state of Texas. We would actually have a third party where the state pays for the Republican and the Democrats' primaries. Mm. Right, like that is funded by taxpayer dollars. And Mommy, if, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. no, if you get at least twenty percent on the statewide ballot, we would get primary. The, the Libertarian Party or the Forward Party, whoever I'm running with, right, would get primary access funded by the state to have their own precincts all of the the organization of the two parties we have now would be required yeah. like so I, I, what my mission is i'm trying to get like 150 people that are our age to give me ten thousand dollars and to agree to run or back a candidate locally because right. i think that's what it's going no one's in that no one does that in politics, right? Everyone's either asking for $25 grassroots campaign donations right. or $100,000 million big, huge checks. And I think we can all, my goal is to inspire 149 other 30-something, 40-something-year-olds that are like, yeah, we can do better than this. Yeah. And we can pick our own leaders and we can actually get our schools better and we can get our drinking water better and we can make sure we don't have blackouts and mm -hmm. we can stop living in a third world country. I mean, my car got stolen two weeks ago in San Antonio from a secured parking garage at uh, the Homewood Suites or mm -hmm. Hampton and Doubletree something, Hilton, I always stay at Hilton. What? Um, and the police don't care. like. Because why? Because insurance is going to pay for it eventually, right? Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm out about $15,000 for the stuff that was in the back of my car. Okay. And people, people's response was, don't leave stuff in your car. And I'm like, I live out of my car for weeks at a time when I'm on the road, yeah. right? Uh, how about we get back to law and order? <laughs> yeah. How about we get back to doing what's right? And... Um, but no, apparently I had my key with me. Apparently what they do is there's like a, a computer app and they digitally recreate your key fob because it's keyless entry, what? right? And yep, so your expedition that you pulled up in, they could, apparently it takes like two minutes. They come up, they do, 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 get in, create a fake key and they're gone and rip out your GPS in the process. Wow, that's wild. So did they find your car? Not yet. Jeez. That's crazy. And it wasn't until today that Geico would spend any time and effort because apparently something like 80% of cars end up being found within the first 30 days. Yeah. Who knows what kind of condition it's going to be. Right at this point, it's been yeah. gone for two weeks. I don't want it back. I was going to say, yeah, you don't. It's probably, yeah. Huh. That is crazy. So if people, like say, you're looking for 150 people, call it 149 because yeah. yeah. you may have had one, including yourself. Uh where would they go to donate ten thousand dollars? Well, don't just go donate ten thousand dollars without calling me and talking well, to me, right? <laughs> okay, but yeah, so contact you. Contact me, but then. yeah, you can donate on my website. Okay, right? so there's, there's a, links to be able to. to it's yeah. not. Like I'm actually raising money science. this time. I have to keep track of it. I have to, you <laughs> know. Yeah. It, well, <laughs> I, last time I didn't accept campaign contributions. Oh, I, I got until you. I made the primary runoff. And then some consultants scammed the owner of the, uh, not scammed, I mean, she's smart, but convinced okay. the uh, owner of the ranch that I work for uh, to give $2 million to my campaign because then I could win a statewide runoff. And all it did was make Wayne Christian drain his coffers of something like $700,000 in his political campaign account. Mm. They went and bought huge buy, you know, television ads and all this stuff. And he killed me in the runoff, right? Yeah. I mean, because that's the machine and hmm. um 
I mean, it didn't help that I was a Republican that got half naked on a pump jack, right? Like that. <laughs> That'll go down in history. For sure. um, apparently, it's already made a political science book. I learned that a few months ago. Amazing. But okay. so you know, I, look, I, I just think we've got to continue to have the conversations. But yes, that's what I'm looking for. And if it happens, great. And if it doesn't, I'll figure something else out. Right. Wow. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'll put all the links in the show notes. And yeah, looking forward to hearing you speak here in a few minutes. Um, keep on the good fight, Sarah. It's amazing to see what you're doing and. Uh, on behalf of Wicked Energy, we wish you nothing but the best. Thanks, Justin. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And always, everyone out there, let's always make sure we're approaching energy with a radically open mind. Be kind and always remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. Have you ever thought about what a podcast could do for your B2B business? Well, you might be surprised by the benefits it could offer. Firstly, podcasts provide an amazing opportunity to establish your brand as an industry thought leader. By sharing your insights, experiences, and expert opinions, you position yourself as an authority, gaining the trust and the respect of your audience. Secondly, hosting a podcast is a fantastic way to engage your customers on a deeper level. It's not just about promoting your products and services, it's about providing value through engaging content, fostering strong relationships, and loyalty among your listeners. Oh, and did I mention networking? Yes, that's a huge part. Podcasts are an incredible networking tool. When you interview guests from your industry, you're not only creating valuable content, but you're also building relationships that can lead to future partnerships and collaborations. But we know starting a podcast can feel daunting. I've had several people reach out to me lately asking how to create a podcast, and that's where I'm going to try and come in and help. I'm here to help you navigate the podcast world. Reach out to me for a 15-minute call where we can discuss your podcasting ambitions. Whether you're starting from scratch or simply looking to improve your existing show, I'm here to help. And guess what? I have a playbook too, a step-by-step guide to launching a successful podcast, and I can't wait to share it with you. This playbook has everything from topic brainstorming to technical setup to effective promotion strategies, all the essentials for a thriving podcast. So why wait? Get in touch today and let's embark on this podcasting journey together. After all, your voice deserves to be heard. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. And look, if you or your organization wants to start a podcast, please visit my website and sign up for a free guide on how to start a successful podcast. Once you get through it, let me know if you have any questions or getting started. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Peace.